Hot button salesmanship, the key to super selling, is a record of the month selection of the Businessmen's Record Club. The club is proud to present an all new recorded speech by that master salesman and sales trainer, Jack Lacey. It is the same speech recently given by Jack to the New York Sales Executives Club. And regardless of whether you have heard Jack before, in his sales clinics, or on tape or record, this new message will offer you dramatic new ways for boosting sales and income. It contains the basic hot button formula Jack derived from a lifetime in sales. Jack has worked as a salesman for more than 45 years. And during that time, he made over 30,000 presentations and closed more than 15,000 sales. He has sold in just about every way that goods or services can be distributed to industry, to business and professional men, to housewives, retailers, wholesalers and distributors, and over retail counters. Jack has been an outstanding success selling food products, books, machinery, transportation, advertising agency services, education, and life insurance. His personal sales frequently exceeded $1 million a year. He was awarded the selling Oscar of the National Sales Executives, the highest honor a salesman can receive. But in addition to being a great salesman, Jack is one of America's foremost sales trainers. As head of the Lacey Sales Institute, he has personally trained more than 100,000 salesmen in his sales clinics across the nation. And more than half a million salesmen have used his films, lectures, books, and other materials. As a result, these salesmen have become better producers who enjoy a corresponding raise in income. Tens of thousands of Lacey trained men have become the sales leaders of their companies. And Jack will offer you the keys to their success in this one record. For here is a top-notch professional with the unusual ability of passing his knowledge, enthusiasm, and confidence on to you. In a few moments, you will hear Jack himself reveal the secrets of hot-button salesmanship. But first, let us tune you in to Mr. Fenn Dosher, introducing Jack to the New York Sales Executives Club. A man of great vision, a man of astute integrity, a man with conviction, a man with a message, a real crusader, a man of great honor, a gentleman, and a real privilege, Jack, to have you back. Now that is an introduction to end all introductions. <laughs> I have had a lot of them all over this country, but Fen, that is, that's it. You're that's a great guy. <laughs> I, I'm always very, very glad to come back here to New York. There's a lot of reasons for that. I got a lot of good friends down here among you. And I like to come back here because you can take your pick of speakers. Just about anybody that you invite to come down and talk to this club is tickled to death to do it. So you can just take your pick of speakers and I got just enough of ham in my blood that when you invite me to come back, I am very, very proud. It is very pleasing. And now today I'm particularly glad because I think as most of you know, I am not working very hard. I am taking life a lot easier. I do not run any more of the big sales clinics. I have not run one for almost three years, and the last one that I ran was for you fellas here in New York. I make a few speeches now and then, but I have a little business up there in Boston where I sell my films and my records, and I keep occupied, and I get a chance to think. And I've been able to sit down, and I've been able to think through some of the things that happened during this career that I had following the clinic here in New York. And I have figured out some things that I feel were responsible for most of the success that I had and many of the successes that came to the companies that used my training in their organizations. And I have come to the conclusion that it's because of two 
very outstanding attributes that we seem to be able to inculcate into men. You know, up to a certain point, all of us learn to sell in exactly the same way. In whatever way we can do it, we get all the information about the proposition we're going to sell. We whip it into a presentation. And then we go out and we start to tell the prospects about this product or service that we sell. At first, we don't make very much headway. All we get are turn downs, or the best thing that happens to us is we occasionally will get a little brush off order. Now, that mystifies us. It baffles us. We say to ourselves, why is it? Why can't I make this thing click? What's wrong? Pretty soon we get discouraged. We get disheartened. We want to quit. And a lot of men do quit at this point. But because you fellows were made of the kind of stuff from which we get salesmen, you keep on going. If you keep going long enough, finally you'll start to click. You'll make a sale now and then. Then you'll sit down one day and you'll figure it out. And you'll say to yourself, well, I make so many calls, I get so many presentations, I get so many sales. I don't know what the figures are in your business, but for the sake of easy, easy illustration, let's say that you make 10 calls, get three interviews and make one sale. You're working on a pattern of 10%. You have put the law of averages to work. Now your problem is a little bit easier because now all you've got to do is to increase the number of calls. And if you make more calls, you get more interviews and more sales. And by working harder and working longer hours and planning your work a little more intelligently, you work it up to maybe where you get 15 calls in instead of 10. And now you average four and a half interviews and one and a half sales. You're making 50% more money, 50% more sales. And as long as you can keep on continuing to increase the number of calls, you increase the number of interviews and the number of sales. But it doesn't take you very long to run out of time. If you can work it up to where you get 20 calls in and six interviews and two sales and double your sales and double your income, you have done very well. But you are still a 10% salesman. Now, if you're ambitious, you want to make more money. You want to do more of the nicer things of life for those you love and for yourself. And if you want to do that, you've got to make more money. You got to get that income up to 10,000, 15,000, 25,000 or more, depending upon what you want to do for that family. So you sit down and you say, what can I do about this? You can't work any harder. You're working as hard as you possibly can. There are no more hours in the day. Well, there's only two ways that I know to do it. One way is to get bigger accounts. And the other way is to change that law of average. Make it work more in your favor. Get a higher percentage of presentations to calls and a higher percentage of sales to interviews. And if you work on it hard enough and long enough, you might work it up to where you make the same 20 calls, but now you get 18 interviews and you get nine sales. And if you keep on perfecting it, you might work it up to 20, 18, and 12. I've seen it done. And now you'll be making six times as much in sales and in money, simply because you found the way to improve that law of average in your favor. And there just isn't any limit to what you can do with this other half of your success as a salesman. You see, the first half comes when you get them around to where they're working on the law of average. They know enough about the product that they can tell a story about it. And, that, and practically every company in America does that. But the real progress and the real money is wrapped up in this other half, this one that changes the ratios. And there is no limit to what you can do with that one. You can run your sales up six times, ten times, fifteen times what they are now. I know, positively, because I have seen thousands and thousands of salesmen do it and I did it myself. And there is no more positive way to prove anything. So I'm delighted that I'm going to have a chance to talk to you fellas today about the things that develop this other half of your real success as a salesman and change these law of averages in your favor. Now, the first step in this is to simplify this entire subject of selling. 
This can be a very complicated and confusing subject if you permit it to do so. It stands to reason. The most universal activity that there is in your life and the life of everybody else is the influence of salesmanship. Every day of your life, you make at least a hundred moves that are influenced by somebody's salesmanship. You get out of bed in the morning, the bed you slept in, the pajamas you wore, the slippers you slide under your feet, your bathrobe, your dentist, your razor, the soap you use, the towel you use, you put your clothes on, your shoes, your socks, your shirts, your tie, you eat your breakfast, everything you put into your mouth, all selected with the aid of somebody's salesmanship. Everything you touch in your office, everything your children touch at school, everything your wife touches at home, sold to her by somebody, right? A hundred times a day, you're influenced by it. And so is every one of the, the 178 million people that live in America. That's 17 billion, 800 million times a day this force asserts itself. It's the most universal thing there is in the lives of all of us with the single exception of breathing. Is it any wonder it can be confusing? Now to add to the confusion, Every guy that has a little success as a salesman that can run a typewriter sits down and writes a book about it. Some of them don't even have to be successful to write the book. You got any idea how many books are registered in the Congressional Library of Washington on the subject of salesmanship? Any idea? Well, hold on to your head. There are 8,250 of them. If you was a fast reader and could read a book a day, do you know how long it would take you to read them? 22 years and eight months. Now that's the subject we're dealing with. Is it any wonder it can get tremendously confusing? So the first thing to do with it is to simplify it. Decide the kind of a salesman you're going to be. What kind of a philosophy are you going to follow? What kind of selling pressure are you going to use? And don't ever let anybody tell you that you can be successful as a salesman without using pressure, because you can't. You have to use all the pressure you can put on, and the higher the pressure, the better. Now, let me tell you what I mean by high pressure. There's two kinds of pressure in selling. One of them is objectionable pressure, offensive pressure. That's poison. That's the one that you put on when you walk into the presence of a prospect with the determination that you're going to sell this guy regardless of anything you find in there. That's the one where you have uppermost in your mind what you're going to get out of it if you make the sale. And that kind of pressure can very quickly become very objectionable and very offensive and make a lot of enemies. The second kind of pressure is acceptable. This is the one that you put on from the standpoint of helping the prospect. If the thought that is uppermost in your mind is a sincere and an earnest and honest intention to help that guy get what he wants now more than anything else, you can put pressure on him until he squeaks in every joint and he will never resent it. I'm a little guy. It would be easy to throw me out. And I have put the pressure on them until they were gasping for breath. And I have never offended anybody with that kind of pressure. So the first thing to do is decide what kind of selling pressure are you going to master. Now, there's a lot of ways that you can learn to be a good salesman. You can use the pressure of affability. This is the one that you use when you make people like you. This is what you do when you entertain people. This is what you do when you... Give them a lot of service. The reason that you entertain them, you take them to a ball game, you take them out to lunch, you play golf with them, or you have them spend a weekend with you on your yacht. And you do all of that for one reason. You want the guy to like you. Because if he likes you well enough, he goes out of his way to find ways to do business with you. That's a pressure of affability. There's a pressure of persistence. You keep coming back and coming back until he finally gives in, gives you a little business. He gets used to having you around. So he gives you a little business. Now, those two pressures are good, but they take a tremendous amount of time. 
And there's a law that governs, governs the degree of success that you're going to enjoy as a salesman. And that law says the length of time it takes you to make a sale determines how many sales you can make during the hours in which it is possible for you to work. So before you decide on a career that is based on affability and persistence, sit down and figure it out. Say to yourself, how much is this business worth after I get it? And if it's worth the investment of time and effort and money that's involved, go to it. I go for affability in that I like everybody to like me and I try to be pleasant and nice to everybody. But I don't spend much time entertaining. And I don't spend very much time giving them a lot of extra service. I wrap the thing up in the beginning so that it will do a good job of service. Because the length of time it takes you to make the sale determines how many sales you're going to make. Now, there's another type of pressure, and that's a pressure of dominance. This is the one that you use when you take charge of the interview. And you sweep the guy, throw it. And you practically force him to buy by overcoming him with your great personality. And then after you're gone, he wakes up and he hates you. And therefore, I never recommend it or I never use it. The kind of pressure that I like is an acceptable pressure. I like hot button salesmanship. And I like that because the two of you are trying to do the same thing. Both of you are trying to help this prospect get the thing that he wants now more than anything else. And in order to use this hot button salesmanship, you have got to measure every call that you make. Because before you go in to see a prospect, you've got to say to yourself, what is it likely that this guy is trying to do? They're not all trying to do the same thing. One man wants to increase his gross sales. Another guy wants to run up his, his net profits. Another guy wants to add to the prestige of his business. Another guy wants to in, get a better position in some markets in the country where he's not operating now. Figure it out. Say, what's he likely to be trying to do? Number two, what does he need to do it? Number three, how can I help him get it? And if you work this way, the minute you get into the interview, you have to use a selling formula that is positive. Because the first thing that you have to do when you sell this way is to crystallize a need in this guy's mind for something he hasn't got now. You've got to find out what it is he's trying to do, and then you've got to figure out what is he need to do it. And then you crystallize that need in his mind, and then the rest of this sale becomes very easy. Because all you have to do after that is to prove to him that you've got the best thing that he can use to fill that need. And then you make him want it enough that he decides to go ahead with it right now. And let me tell you something that's going to amaze you. It never fails. And you know why it works so good? It does the two things that do more to make a guy a top bracket salesman than anything else he can introduce into his life. It makes him develop a selling imagination. Because he can't start hunting for hot buttons without imagining what's going on in the life of this guy that he's trying to sell. He has to build a selling imagination to find hot buttons. And as soon as he builds that imagination, he does the other great thing in selling. He becomes a creative salesman. Because as he hunts for these hot buttons and he figures out what it is that this guy that he's talking to wants, he begins to develop these tremendous powers of digging out uses for his product that the prospect he is talking to may not even suspect exists. And if you happen to get it for a business, you might do the most fabulous thing imaginable in your business. Let me tell you a story right out of New York. The first time that I came to work in New York, I came down here as the general sales manager of Fast Freight. Most of you are familiar with that little company. Why well, didn't the little company now? It's a big one now. But when I worked, went to work for them, it was a little company. They had been in business for 12 years. They were doing two and a half million a year. We had one advantage over our competitors. Our schedules were 10% more dependable. If you gave us 100 shipments, we would deliver 99 of them on schedule. Our competitors would deliver 90. 
And for 12 years, they were selling 10% more dependable schedules and they had built the business up to two and a half million a year. And then I came along and I used this hot button philosophy in my selling then. So I began to dig into it and I tried to find out what's the hot button in this business. So I went to some of our customers and I said, why do you want more dependable schedules? And I found out that the reason they wanted them was that with more dependable schedules, they could operate their businesses with a smaller inventory. Then I decided I would find out what it meant to run a business with a smaller inventory. So I went down to Harvard to the business school and I dug into it. And I learned that the size of the inventory determines how much you pay for rent, insurance, interest, and taxes. Smaller inventory, you need less space, your rent is less. You borrow less money to carry the inventory. Your taxes are less. And I found out that those items represented 9% of the gross sales of the business. Then I found out that with our dependable schedules, we actually could cut those inventories by a third. We cut those 9% costs by a third. So we actually give the guy an increase of 3% in his net profits. So now we don't go in there anymore and say we have more dependable schedules. We go in and we say, we will show you how to add 3% to your net profits. How much net profit did you make last year? This is 5%. We say, okay, we'll show you how to run it up 60%. We'll show you how to make 8%. You will pay us 20% more to handle your freight than you're paying now. Your freight bill represents 1% of your gross sales. And that means, Mr. Prospect, that every time you give us a dollar, we give you back 15. In the following eight years, they went to $25 million. Took them 12 years, you get to two and a half. We got the hot button, and in the eight depression years, 1929 to 1937, the eight worst depression years this country has ever known, we sent those sales up over a thousand percent. You just can't do anything with your salesman other than build this kind of an imagination into him and make him creative salesman if you go over to hot button salesmanship. Now, fortunately, you don't have to buy anything from me to use it. Of course, you'll be a lot better off if you use my films and my records. But you don't have to use them. All you got to do is adopt this philosophy and say, we hunt for hot buttons. Now, after you get this going in your men, you got a lot of self-starters. You got a lot of guys that can handle themselves out in the field. They don't need supervision from you night and day. Now you got to get a good approach. You got to get the kind of an approach that makes busy people stop and listen. In your business, as in every other business, there's always two kinds of prospects. There's the guy that is so busy, he cannot be interrupted by you or me or anybody else. But if you succeed in making that guy listen, you invariably find that he's got plenty of money with which to buy your proposition. In other words, he's got no time but all kinds of money. And there's the other type of prospect, the guy with no money and all kinds of time. <laughs> and the only one that's any good is the busy prospect. And what you say in the opening sentence determines how many of the busy people are going to stop and listen? Up here in Pennsylvania, there's a little company, the Rudd Mellican Company, who sell coffee vending machines. They go into the plant and they say to the operator of the industrial plant, we'd like to put a couple of our coffee vending machines in here. We'll improve the morale of your workers. We'll give them a fresh cup of coffee because the coffee is brewed when you drop the, drop the dime in the slot. They get a fresh cup of coffee. That improves their morale, they do more work for you. And you save the time they now spend walking down to the restaurant and walking back to get the cup of coffee. And then they hired me to do a little job for them. And I went to work to find out what's the hot button in this business. And I found out that if a man had 250 workers, just a little plant, and they take two coffee breaks a day, which they all do, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, it takes them five minutes to walk down to the restaurant and five minutes to walk back. They do that twice a day, that's 20 minutes a day, 250 workers, that's 5,000 minutes. In round numbers, that's 80 hours. He pays him a dollar and a half an hour. He pays him $120 a day to walk down to the corner and walk back. 
In the course of a five-day week, he pays them $600. In a 50-week year, that's $30,000. And now they walk in and they say to the guy, if you let us put a couple of coffee vending machines in your plant, we'll give you $30,000 a year. What do you think happened to their sales? Now, the next thing is your demonstration. And when you have dug the hot button out, you have got a good demonstration. Because in order to dig out hot buttons, he's got to learn all of the features of your product. And he has to learn all the benefits that each feature reflects itself into in the life of every prospect that he sells. He has to understand the product and he has to understand the service. He has no choice in the matter. So now he makes a good demonstration. The next thing is your clothes. And you know, I think there's more misunderstanding about clothes and sales than about anything else in selling. A lot of people think closing is tough. Closing is the simplest and the easiest thing in the whole presentation when it's done right. Let me give you my clothes. When I get down to the point where I'm going to close a guy, I say to him this. Now, I, I proved to him that he needs something. And I proved to him I got the best thing he can use to fill the need. And now all that's necessary is to get action. When I get to this point with him, I say, how many men have you got? He says, I got a hundred. I say, mark that down, will you, on a piece of paper? I want you to do a little figuring here. I'm not too good at figures, so I want you to do this figuring. Now, the reason I want the guy to do the figuring is this. He can watch me figure all day without ever thinking once what I'm doing. But he can't make one mark on that paper without thinking what he's putting down there. So I say to him, how many men you got? He says, I got a hundred. I say, put that down, will you? He puts it down. I say, how much do they cost you? He says, they cost me $10,000 a piece. I say, how much is 100 men at $10,000? He figures it out. I say, just add two zeros at the bottom of your 10,000 guy. Yeah, I don't want him to make any mistake. I say, how much is that? He says, that's a million dollars. I say, how much do they have to sell to make it practical for you? He says, well, they got to sell at least 10 times what I pay. I say, how much is 10 times a million? He says, that's 10 million. I say, now suppose that I increase your sales 5%. How much will I increase them? Figures out, he says, $500,000. I say, what was your net last year? He says, it was 5%. <clears throat> I say, what is 5% of $500,000? He says, that's $25,000. I say, that's what you're going to get. You're going to give me 10 of it. In other words, I'm going to train this group of yours for nothing and give you $15,000 the first year. <laughs> and every year after that, you keep the 25000 And if he hasn't been closed by that, I say to him, now look, you don't want me to walk out that door with all that money that belongs to you, do you? <laughs> That's my clothes. And I want to tell you this, it is almost an impossibility to get away from it. Sometimes he's skeptical. He says to me, will you prove it? I say, sure, I'll prove it to you two ways. I'll take you on a percentage basis. I will do the job for you for nothing. And I will take half of your increased net for the three years as my pay. But if you take that deal, you're going to pay through the nose because you're going to pay me at least $12,500 a year or $37,500 instead of the $10,000 for which you can buy it now. And I say the other way I'm going to prove it to you is this. I will give you a list of everybody that I ever worked with. No exceptions. And if you find one dissatisfied customer, I will do this job for you for nothing. That's my clothes. Now, you see what this does? It makes them develop a selling imagination. It makes them become a creative salesman. That generates within him a confidence and an enthusiasm that makes the guy almost irresistible. He loves to sell. He develops a thirst for more knowledge of these top bracket things in selling. He's making more money. He loves to do it. And you like to do the things that you do well. Is that right? That's a law. And you do well the things you like to do. 
and you think about the things that you do well, so the thing all just piles up. And some of these figures are just positively fabulous. I made all my money, not by the running of the clinics. You can't make much money running clinics. I had a fabulous income. I was grossing $200,000 a year. And I did it for about 10 years. I handled $2 million. But at the end of the year, when I would take in 200,000, 80,000 of them and went to the clubs, we gave them 40%. It took another $70,000 of my 120 to pay the expenses of getting them. So I would wind up with about 50 to $60,000. I'd pay my taxes on it, which were another 25. And then I would live on 10 of it. And when I got through, I'd have $15,000 left out of the 200,000. So I sat down and I said to myself, well, if I last in this business for 10 years, which will be a long time, most of them don't last that long. Most of them don't last over three or four years. And I said, well, if I last 10 years, I save every nickel I make and I don't make any mistakes. At the end of that time, I'll have $150,000. If I invested at the prevailing rate of interest, which is 3%, I'll have $4,500 a year or $75 a week on which to spend the rest of my days in a hospital or a sanitarium. I says, this is no good. The only way I can make any money is the way in which I made it. And the way I made money was by buying the stocks of the companies when I agreed to train their men. I trained a group of men for the American Airlines, and those 75 men put our stuff all through the American Airlines. I bought the American Airlines stock for $8 a share when I started to train them, and three years later, I sold it for $24. It went up 300%. When I started to work with Corning Glass, I bought the stock at $12 a share. Actually, I bought it at $30, but they gave us two and a half for one, so that reduced it to $12 a share. Any of you guys know what Corning Glass closed at yesterday? 167. And I was loaded with Corning Glass stock. I bought Pfizer's stock at $37 a share when they put my stuff all through their business, and two or three years later, I sold it at 100 I bought General Electric stock at $18 a share. You know what it closed at yesterday? 93 and a half. You wouldn't think that you could influence the sales of a terrific company like that to the extent of exercising an influence on their net profits, would you, with a little thing like hot-button salesmanship? We took 50 salesmen, one in each branch, Taught them how to use our stuff and to train the retail salesmen of the retail dealers handling the major appliances. Those 50 salesmen trained 10,000 salesmen. And the first year it was in operation in General Electric's business, it made a difference in their sales of $165 million. This is what you're thinking about. This is the power of what I'm talking to you about. Hot button salesmanship. And if you think it's all over, that it was just that rising market that did it, the last company that put my stuff in their business from one end of the company to the other was the American Photocopy Equipment Company. And they did it less than two years ago. And I bought their stock at $66 a share. They gave us two for one. That reduces the cost of that stock to $22 a share. And it closed yesterday at 68 went up 300% in less than two years. Now, I can prove all of this to you. These figures are all on record. As Fenn told you, in 1943, when I first began talking about running these clinics in New York, I was broke. I had a business on my hands that was bankrupt. I owed $20,000. I was living on a $60 a week drawing account selling life insurance for the Connecticut General Life Insurance Company in Boston. In 43, I got the combination on this hot button salesmanship in the sale of life insurance. And by February of 1944, I was the number two producer in the Connecticut General Life Insurance Company who have 500 salesmen and our friend down here in the insurance business will tell you that they are as good as any group of salesmen in the life insurance business in America. Am I right? And I was the number two man in that outfit using what I'm telling you to use, hot-button salesmanship. 
The first three months of 1944, my commissions for selling life insurance were $12,000. I can prove it as I paid my taxes on it. And it'll do exactly the same for any one of you fellas that want to use it. It never misses. I bought 20 stocks this way. 19 of them were winners. I lost money on one stock. That was the Springfield Fire and Marine Insurance Company. <laughs> we set the sales up from 50 to $58 million in two years. But it was the two years when they had all the hurricanes. <laughs> <laughs> I want to sell you this idea. I got, I'm, I'm not going to get anything out of this. I'm not going to run any more clinics. You can't put your men in my clinics. You can do this without my films. As I said, you'll be a lot better off if you buy my films from Roy Hall here in the club. But you don't have to. All you got to do is train your men to be hot button hunters, and this goes to work in your business without any help from me or without any help from anybody else. Just one last thing. Don't think this is easy. It's hard. You and your men have to think, and that's the hardest work you ever do. I get a kick when I read about these, I read these ads. Some guy says, buy my record, listen to it, and in a week you make $25,000 a year. Some guy says, buy my book next week, you make 25 000. Always reminds me of a friend of mine. I had a kid, 10 years of age. One night, the old man comes home, he says to the kid, son, he says, I want you to think big about everything. Don't waste your time thinking small about anything. Think big about everything. Kid says, that's a great idea, Dad. I'm for that. The next night, the old man comes home, the kid's got a sign out in front of the house. Puppy for sale, $50,000. The old man says, well, this kid's gone haywire. I'll have to straighten him out. <laughs> but he was busy that night. He couldn't get around to it, so he says, I'll take care of it the next night. Next night he came home, the sign was down. He says to the kid, what'd you do with the sign? He says, I took it down. He says, why? He says, I sold the puppy. <laughs> <coughs> he says, how much did you get for him? He said, I got $50,000. He says, who gave you $50,000 for that mutt? He says, Henry Horner, the kid in the next block, gave me two $25,000 cats. <laughs> Let me wind up by saying this to you. Let me wind this up by saying this to you, will you? You can do this. Your men can do it. I know. I know positively. Because I have seen at least 25,000 salesmen do it. And I did it myself. And there is nothing brilliant about me. And there is nothing impressive about me. I just know one thing. I know how to sell. And I have told you the formula this morning that did it for me and did it for all these men. And thousands of them are in the biggest sales jobs in America. IBM, Remington Rand, Park Davis, Motorola, Pfizer, thousands of them. And what those men do, I am absolutely positive that you can do. Because when you go over to this hot button type of selling, you put to work one of the most powerful laws there is in business. <laughs> And that's the law that says when you can sell better, you earn more. That law never fails. It's as positive as the sun coming up in the east and going down in the west. I know positively because I have seen thousands and thousands of men do it. And I did it myself. And every one of you men and every one of your salesmen can do it, too, if you want to use it. But awful nice to visit with you. Thank you for inviting me. Goodbye and good luck. Gentlemen, the meeting is adjourned.